I'm here to talk to you about three things. Um, hopefully, uh, I've been advised that you don't want anything too salesy, so hopefully it won't be too salesy. Uh, I've got 400 slides, we've got 30 minutes, so I'm hoping you're gonna pay attention. I've actually only got six, so that's, uh, and one of them's a video. If it gets too long as a video and you get bored, tell me and I'll turn it off and I'll talk to actually the experience itself. Um, I could do this without slides, but it's pretty boring if you've not got something to look at and I'm not that attractive, so. Um, so, we have three parts to this. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about some history uh, and a bit of education or setting, ex setting some realities and perception uh, in place around Watson. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the weather company as well um, and how that's educated IBM, so our acquisition of the weather company. As you know, we buy companies left, right, and center, uh, spending a lot of money on technology. Uh, I think $20 billion on analytics companies alone. If you add to that the weather company at $2 billion and software at $3 billion, then you're, you know, you're looking at some big money. Um, we'll go through uh, some of the science that sits behind the weather company uh, and how uh, we've used and enhanced what the weather company did with IBM. So uh, we're going to go through um, the deep thunder capabilities at a high level just to explain how that works and how, how we've kind of added on top of what the weather company did before. Uh, and then we're going to go and look at how that's affected the future of IBM and the weather company as a whole. Um, and it's, inf it's affected us more than you would think. So, let's get started. He says, waiting for the slide to move. There we are. Okay, so uh, everybody heard of Watson? Yep, good, okay. Uh, so Watson started as a research project in 2006. Uh, in 2011, when I was working at Accenture, uh, I got invited to go to a dinner, uh, which was around the time that the Jeopardy Grand Challenge had just been completed over in the US. Uh, so Q&A answering, how do, uh, you know, uh, the, the, everybody aware of the Jeopardy challenge as well. You know what Jeopardy is, yeah? Most people know, that's good. So don't have to explain that. Uh, and at the same time, we launched Watson Explorer on-premise, which is effectively natural language processing, text, text mining, text analytics, uh, through an application that could, uh, could crawl across data sources, either internal or external, pull that information back, create an index around it, and then allow you to interrogate that with, um, with natural language processing in, in a kind of assisted way. Um, so, that got us so far, and we built a lot of applications out like that. Um, it was quite expensive, £250,000 per, per license, so quite a big install cost. Very difficult to get going, so usually about a million to £2 million pounds to actually get through a pilot. Um, so not, not really accessible, right? So um, it, it was okay, it got us to where we needed to be, and we, we had some good early wins. Uh, and then we started to build that into products, so we created Watson Analytics, and how many of you have used Watson Analytics or seen it? Yep, so quite a few of you. Uh, so effectively, uh, Watson Analytics allows you to ask natural language questions and it will run the queries in the background. So it will make interpretations based on what you're looking at. Um, it uses graph technology in the back end uh, and it starts to look at how, um, how one, an one question that you ask of a, of a data set might link to lots of other answers around that data set. So if you ask a question about churn, it might find a whole load of other facts that you, that you might want to be interested in uh, by the way it's been deployed. We also created and launched in 2014 uh, something called DataWorks, and that, date, that capability was uh, effectively a, a data management layer in the cloud, quite simply. Uh, and then also Bluemix uh, as, another, as another launch. Bluemix is like for application developers, people who want to build mobile apps or web apps, um, and uh, we, we launched that. And then finally, we launched a set of APIs around Watson itself, which were cloud-based consumption of artificial intelligence capabilities in a managed environment. And then in 2015, at the same conference, but a year later, uh, we were on stage and we announced that we bought the weather company. Now, why did we buy the weather company? Anybody want to hazard a guess or can tell any, can, can want to hazard an answer? Why do you think we bought it? Domain expertise, partly, yes. Data, no, we already had access to it through a partnership agreement, so we didn't need to buy that. So we bought it. I'll <laughs> we bought the weather company because um, it had an IoT platform that scaled. Okay, so they were a mainframe business and they came off the mainframe uh, without any help from anybody. Uh, and they built their own infrastructure out to replace that mainframe capability. 
Uh, and in doing so, they created a, a system. And as we were kind of working with them, we were talking to them about uh, what they were doing with the IBM capabilities and you know, what, uh, what we were doing with the data, we, we kind of asked the question, so how many, uh, how many transactions are you processing a day? And they said, oh, we're doing 27 billion transactions a day. And at that point, our architects were like, sorry? Is it, you did say a day, didn't you? You know, it wasn't a month, it wasn't a week, it was, you know, it was a day. Yeah, yes, 27 billion transactions a day. But that's three times as many as Google searches. Yep, that's right. How? And I said, well, we're in every single mobile phone, pretty much. We're in lots of uh, main portals for all of the big uh, portal solutions on the internet. Uh, people have embedded our technology into their websites everywhere. So every time somebody opens up a web browser or an application, actually what it's doing is it's sending a real-time call off onto the web, into the web, into the cloud, and actually making a call back and looking at the uh, and, and pulling back a, a unique weather forecast for that person based on their geolocation. Twenty-seven billion times a day, 130 million devices every month. Okay, that's big reach. Um, and if you think about that word reach and the use of that word against the weather, then you might think about where this is going. But uh, 2016, uh, we launched something called the Watson Data Platform. It was an early version, and it still was not integrated across the experiences. So if you wanted to do data management, you wanted to do analytics, you wanted to do AI machine learning through Watson, uh, you wanted to do application development deployment, that was all separate, and each experience was separate. And we bought this company called SoftLayer, which we mentioned earlier, which was meant to be our cloud capability, uh, and that, um, whilst it was a good acquisition, gave us lots of scale, lots of data centers, actually the way that it had been constructed was for smaller businesses and we needed something for enterprise. So when you talk about enterprise, it, it's kind of got some challenges when you look at sort of the enterprises that IBM works with. Um, it works globally, okay? So you've got to be able to access data wherever that data is and actually you need to be accessing it in the same way regardless of where you sit. You want... Um, you want a lot of power, you want a lot of throughput, you don't want any latency, uh, you want to choose between graphical processing units to do your analytics and optimization on, or you want to use Wintel servers, or you want to be able to deploy it, you want to change the hardware, you want to change the, you know, the storage, the, the compute power, and you want to do that automatically or, or manually based on how you want to do things. Um, and we couldn't, right? So we had to sit there and say, okay, so what did we learn from the weather company? We learned that they've got 1,300 microservices-based applications which have been uniquely built from the ground up, from hardware to data, data staging, data layering, through to applications that undertake machine learning, data science, uh, that then deploy that into an API interface that then is able to be called from wherever it may be. And they took all of that learning and then they said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to start from the ground up, we're going to build new data centers. And we're going to build in this capability across our entire cloud capability that brings all of those experiences that everyone's complaining about are really tough to engineer using different APIs to pull things together to create new solutions. What we're going to do is we're going to actually build that up from the ground up and we're going to release a new, a new version uh, of what we have. So uh, next week in Stockholm, we've got an event for a selected number of customers and we're launching that um, to, to the marketplace here. Um, that will see... Uh, an addition of the data science experience, which I think some of you have seen in demos outside. Some of you have come to speak, see us on the stand, but again, we'll be around and we'll, we'll take you through that if you want to see that. Um, if you think through what's in there and why is that different than what we've, what everyone else has got, from an IBM perspective, we've got a big install base of SPSS. And as if you were in the room yesterday, you heard me say that nobody wants to buy SPSS or very few people want to buy SPSS anymore because it, it costs quite a lot of money to buy as a license. And then you've got to pay uh, a recurring cost every year for maintenance fees. And people don't like that. Okay. Uh, and also, everybody that's coming out of university and a lot of you guys in the room actually want to use Python. You want to use R. You want to use it natively. You don't want to use it embedded within an SPSS flow. Um, you want choice. So what we've done is we've taken all of those open source tools and we've put them in a wrapper, which is called Data Science Experience. So we have Scala, we have Python, we've got uh, Cafe, we've got TensorFlow. Uh, pretty much you name it, it's going into that tool. Um, so fast forward to 2017 and uh, we've, we've added in something which we think is the kind of the key differentiator in what is going to set our cloud experience apart from everybody else. And that's really something called the data catalog. So the data catalog is effectively a presentation of data that sits in our cloud or in somebody else's cloud, in your data on-premise. Uh, it's secure. 
it's encrypted at rest and in, and in transit. Um, it has uh, the ability to catalog things automatically, so you can point it at a data source wherever it sits, and it will pull back that information. And using Watson's cognitive capabilities, it will work out what the data is that sits underneath that, and it will try and make an, an attempt to say, actually, the data that you're looking at is perhaps an account number uh, for a credit card, and therefore, that should be masked. And when it's presented to users, it should only be presented to these users with these policies. So actually, policy enforcement across there. Um, and taking away the challenge of should a data scientist be able to see the information in this field, and, or actually can they just use it? Um, and presenting all data, so regardless of where it sits, as I say, in your existing systems or somewhere else, in there. So we talked about the weather company. So Deep Thunder itself uh, uses something called a 3D telescopic grid. Uh, where data from one model feeds into another and it's verified with historical data. So they start off with a global model um, and as they zoom in, the resolution decreases exponentially down to many, many models, uh, down to a kilometre and sometimes as small as one metre. So we take weather service data in and we forecast that and we look at satellite imagery. Uh, we have client information coming in and business data being pulled into a solution. The IBM Deep Thunder capability uh, then merges that together uh, we create a temporal view of weather and business data overlaid. So actually, this is so then you starting to get into a commercial use of data. From there, we look at a forecast modeling system that enables us to forecast and look at what particular events might link to business events that are relevant to weather. So really good in retail, specifically. Uh, but also, uh, when you start to look at advertising products and looking at real-time advertising, um, and again, hints to where we're going, um, this, this is kind of really important. Uh, so then we have some predictive models that feed back into Deep Thunder using those forecast models. Uh, we create an augmented output of weather and business data which allows people to then visualize all of that capability. And then we create a graphic visualization that, that goes back. And then some output back to a client browser that gives them the view of uh, their weather, their, their business modeled against the weather and the impacts of that data as it occurs. All down to a really fine grain of weather forecasting that by uh, industry standards has been rated number one in the world. Okay. So um, we've taken, has anybody used the Weather Company app? First of all, does anybody use the weather, the weather Channel? No? Yeah, a few of you, okay. You probably haven't seen this feature. So we've embedded Watson into the Weather Company app. Uh, so in the US in particular, where this is launched, uh, so we launched it, um, probably late last year with a few companies, so Toyota being one, another one being Campbell Soup. Uh, effectively, based on the weather forecast that you have and uh, the fact that you're looking at this data, we've created a programmatic advertising capability that you can click on the ad from within that application and it brings you into a unique microsite for Toyota driven by Watson. So you start to interact with the weather and the data there as an experience. Uh, and that's been taken up quite well. So what I'm gonna do is quickly run through a video so you don't have to listen to my voice anymore. Hello, welcome to Watson Ads, the world's first cognitive advertisement. Watson Ads enable users to interact with IBM Watson, an AI system that can understand, reason, and learn. Watson is trained using brand-specific data, in this case, Campbell's recipes. Watson Ads also provide a sophisticated targeting platform that uses weather data and more to target users at the most relevant time. Let's see it in action. Here I see a Watson ad within the weather app. It takes into consideration weather data. Warm up with a totally new recipe created by you and Campbell's. Let's make something. Watson, make me something Italian with chicken and no mushrooms. Here, Watson has created a number of recipe inspirations for me. The key here is created. Watson created these recipes using its deep knowledge of recipes and ingredient pairings along with data from Campbell's. Each Watson generated recipe features a branded ingredient. Watson generates the ingredients, their proportions, and the preparation steps. You can like a recipe. You can email it to your friends, or you can share it on social media. You can explore other Watson invented recipes. You can view them, you can like them, and you can share them. Watson ads are also modular. 
they allow for other content, like videos and coupons. You have now seen the world's first cognitive advertisement, Watson Ads. Watson Ads enable users to interact with IBM Watson, an AI system that can understand, reason, and learn. With Watson Ads, users can create and engage with products in a way never before seen in advertisements. Thank you. Okay, so quite a lot went into that, um, strangely enough. A lot of analytics, a lot of data science, a lot of AI, um, a lot of technology, a lot of inventions. Um, has anybody seen Chef Watson before? No? Okay, so Chef Watson is available on the web. Uh, you can go into it, you can interact, you can put in your own favorite ingredients, and you can basically create your own recipes. And what they've done is they've basically uh, taken the knowledge of uh, some really experienced chefs that know how to put together recipes, and they've embedded that knowledge into an application. Uh, and what that does is it looks at the food pairings and the tastes and the chemical signatures of food, and then starts to look at how those things can be combined together to recreate different things. So they've created chocolate pudding with no chocolate in. Okay, they've created uh, things that taste like really familiar dishes that you would eat without unhealthy products in. Um, you know, the, the sort of the, <laughs> they've they've gone to an indigenous island and only fed it with the ingredients that are available on that indigenous island and said, "Watson, make me a recipe." And then they've actually had a a, 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 a really well-known chef make the stuff, and uh, people have sat there and then tasted it after he's made it. Sometimes it doesn't taste that great because Watson's still learning, but um, you know, it's, uh, it, there's a whole recipe book available as well. So actually, if you want to look at some of the recipes that Watson has come up with across the globe, then you can look at those sorts of things as well. Um, quite gimmicky, but actually proves a point that actually something as sensitive as taste and as complex as food and combinations of products uh, can be can be taught to a computer, and the computer can then do something that we wouldn't think would be possible. Okay. So, what have we really done? Um, so, when we when we sit and talk about, um, you know, what has IBM done as a result of buying the weather company, uh, and we look back at what we've learned, uh, what we've learned is that the way that we were going to market wasn't relevant. Okay, we were speaking to customers and providing with solutions and responses to RFPs, which were driving multi-million dollar software license solutions with multi-multi-million dollar um, you know, services solutions for, for products and services. Right? Um, people were signing up for products. If your procurement divisions have anything to do with acquiring IBM products, if any of you work for large enterprises, and they were sitting on shelves unused because somebody in procurement bought a tool from IBM that they didn't need or they didn't want to use, or they had nobody in the business that wanted to use it. Uh, so what we've done is we've created a different marketplace. Uh, we're reinventing IBM from the ground up, starting at the hardware level, embedding in security, things like data lineage and the, the ability to comply with GDPR in Europe, um, which again, you know, it, it's not going to be easy. And I know certainly yesterday's session we found 15, 20 people that hadn't even started on that journey and they had quite a bit of work to do in between now and May. Um, they have built in from the ground up the effect of the ability to ingest data, to store it in any shape or form that you want. So be it in any of the open source language uh, technologies or actually any of the, uh, the proprietary things that are databases that you might use in your enterprise. So IBM, Oracle, Microsoft, connect to Azure, connect to Amazon working on Teradata at the moment, for those of you that have spent even more money than you spent on an IBM system on one of those. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, looking at how that integrates with, so from a data engineering perspective, how you pull all of that data together and present it for data analysts, data scientists to use through things like the data catalog. Uh, looking at then how you then start to use it for different applications, so be that through uh, things like uh, the Watson capabilities, the Watson AI, which I think, you know, when, certainly from an IBM perspective, three quarters of the time we get called in to speak to people, they want to talk to us about Watson. And then the first thing they say is, yeah, but I want to use Watson for machine learning. And then we say, well, okay, that's really good, but Watson can't count. Okay, Watson can understand, reason, and learn. It can look at images, it can work out tastes, but it doesn't count. That's analytics. Um, so it's slightly different. We use machine learning within Watson, uh, but it doesn't do machine learning itself. So it's not a machine learning capability that you'd sign up for, right? What you'd sign up for is a service that uses machine learning under the covers, but actually the presentation or the view that you interact with is, is, is kind of uh, is focused on the outcome that you're trying to do. So you want to create a chatbot, 
use Watson conversation, right? Uh, you want to look at images, you use image recognition. Um, those sorts of things. So you're not doing hard coding at that point. If you want to do hard coding and you want to develop your own applications and your own way, then we have Watson Machine Learning. It's got the Watson badge at the front of it, but actually it's not a Watson product. <laughs> um, so it has some Watson capabilities in it again, but um, that they're all available. So we have the ability to build and execute data flows. We have the ability to do um, to undertake all different types of analytics. Uh, we can build and deploy machine learning models. Uh, we have the ability to connect that into developer interfaces without going off platform. Uh, and if you have got data stored in other platforms and you've already signed up for Azure or you've already signed up for Amazon and, and you've put all your data into those platforms, we can connect to it, leave it where it is, catalog it, bring it into an enterprise-wide catalog that also looks at everything that you've got within your enterprise as well, as well as the stuff that you put in our cloud. So we're, we're assuming here and there's a, you know, there's a big assumption that actually what's going to happen is that in the future we'll have a hybrid, hybrid approach. You'll have on-premise, you'll have private cloud and public cloud, and you'll have a set of multi-cloud providers that are going to provide the services and applications that you need to go forward as you build out your businesses and applications and capabilities. Um, and we don't want you to be IBM only. We want you to have the best experience possible using the tools that you want to use. And that is not something you would have heard from an IBM standing on stage. Okay. Um, so I'm conscious I've got five minutes or so left. Um, has anybody got any questions about any of the capabilities that uh, you might want to go through or anything I've talked about today? Yes. Uh, the natural language processing, or on which languages is it available? OK, that's a good question. Shall we find out? Uh, so the, the question was, uh, which languages are available in the natural language processing? So. Where would you like to go? Would you like to go to cloud, or would you like to go to on-premise? Uh, OK, let's start with cloud then. So, Fingers crossed my data connection works. There we are. OK, so we're into the Bluemix catalog. The Bluemix catalog is our area for all of the services that we have in IBM. Um, probably a little bit like Azure, but actually some of these are, are, are kind of slightly uh, so I would say slightly more integrated in my experience. Um, so we are looking at natural language processing and which languages we work in. Let's see if we can find that information relatively quickly. So every API is built the same way. Uh, it's presented in the catalog in the same way. There are a set of documents attached to every single API and that explains the API itself. All of the pricing is publicly published. If you work for a big company, don't go via the direct site. Go back through your IBM reps, and you'll get discounted pricing. Okay? If you go direct as a consumer and you put your credit card in, you'll get the price that's on the, on the front page. Okay? But most, most customers have an agreement with IBM if they're of any sort of scale and they buy any sort of level of software from them that actually gives them an entitlement to discounts, and you should always do that. Personally, I would do that because I, I don't want to pay full price for anything. Um, I didn't used to work for IBM, by the way. I've only been here four years, and I was a client. And I, my first experience was awful. So um, about, so let's see if we can find in the documentation. So OK, so then we have listed uh, what is the language support per API. Uh, so Arabic, Chinese, Czech, Dutch, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Spanish. Unfortunately, we may not have every language in there, but that's being worked on, and there's a constant roadmap that's being reviewed all the time. So if there's a language that you need and that you want, um, actually, the, the way that we uh, are working now, again, is very different IBM. So when people come to us and say, actually, uh, I want this to change, uh, or this doesn't work for me, and I'd, I'd prefer it to work like this because of XYZ, um, what we found is that actually speaking to the offering teams now, they're actually listening to that, and because they're developing in an agile way, very quickly, we start to see capabilities and changes brought into the product that are as a direct result of, product, of customer client feedback. That used to happen once a year. It's now happening every week. OK, so very different IBM. And it really has changed everything in IBM from the ground upwards. There's still all of the old school stuff. People still sell hardware and still sell mainframes. Uh, the sellers are still targeted on selling software to you on, on both license and, uh, on, uh, and in the cloud. but 
there is a different IBM operating within IBM. And I think we were just having a dialogue just before to say, actually, your, your view of IBM is usually the sales team, right? And they're the people that come and visit you and try and sell you stuff. And you're like, look, we just get past the PowerPoint and get into the product, right? Get, get to the meat and drink. I don't want to see all of this stuff. Um, I just want to see the product. Um, and that is starting to change. Yeah, it's not finished, but it's starting to change.